How's it going, everybody? This is Dave Meltzer. We're going to be here for the next two hours talking pro wrestling during this most newsworthy week in history of this industry. We've got Brian Alvarez of Figure Four here, and uh, we're going to have Brock Lesnar, former NCAA champion, who's currently wrestling at Ohio Valley Wrestling. Uh, we'll be talking to him for the first time. He'll be up in about a half an hour. We'll be taking your phone calls as well as your emails, and I think that this may be a day where it may be a little bit easier to get through on the phone uh, than it maybe have would have been in the last, I don't know, two weeks or so. Uh, certainly, we were flooded with calls for Jerry Lawler, and of course, with the, the sale and everything, it's been pretty darn hard to get through, though people have gotten through. And uh, anyway, that's uh, so you can call us at one eight seven seven three nine two thirty two ninety nine. In about a half an hour, we'll start taking phone calls. Brian, how are you today? I'm doing good. That's good. Um, God, you sound so different. <laughs> I know. We shouldn't fool uh, the listeners. I'm actually at Dave's house today. On the other microphone. <laughs> and for all you wondering, he's sitting here in a FUBU sweatshirt, and he's eating a banana. <laughs> None of that's true, but that's okay. Um, okay, so last night, last night was the night that it finally hit, because there really was no thunder. And I will say, I didn't miss it for a second, but I will miss it. Monday, it's going to be a total change of life. It was just weird. I was, uh, I usually have to set the VCR every Wednesday night, and... Last night I sat there and I had nothing to do. No VCR to set, no show to watch. It's kind of weird. And you're, I guess you're uh, working on an article for Penthouse on the demise of WCW. Is that basically what it is? <laughs> yes. They uh, they just heard about the demise a couple of days ago and they said, you know what would be a good column is a column on the 10 greatest moments <laughs> of WCW history. And I said, hey, that's great. And I hung up and I started trying to think of 10 great moments in WCW history and I got stuck about four. No, I, I I sent. I don't know. You helped me last night. Yeah, but then you know when I started like thinking of all these great moments, they ended up all being terrible. I know. I get this email and it's it, your email was so long, and I thought, man, how could he have thought of so many great things? And it was like <laughs> uh, a quarter of it was the great things, and then there was uh, about twenty five lines of the most horrible things that have ever happened in that company, and oh uh, it was great. The uh, let's see. Um, of course, uh, every, pretty much everyone in the company, as far as office people, were laid off yesterday at the meeting at uh, the power plant. A couple of people were kept on, but they're only being kept on for like 30 more days to help in the transition. The first uh, taping under the auspices of the World Wrestling Federation, uh, well, the first television show on TNN is going to be on May the 12th on Saturday night from 11, to, 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. The taping will be May the 9th in Trenton, New Jersey. So uh, those dates are now pretty much, they are finalized. That's the real deal. And uh, what else? Um, I saw the uh, New York Daily News story today. And, you know, one more uh, thing about the meeting real quick that was so lame was Brad Siegel was not there. No, that's right. After all that he had done, you know, not telling these guys anything, or when he was telling them something, it was basically a lie, to not show up on that last day, what a jerk. Yeah. Well, just the whole, I'll tell you what, he... You know, there are people who think that, like, of all the people responsible, ultimately he was the most for killing the company. I mean, and there's a lot of blame to go around to a lot of different people, some of whom have just resurfaced in the last day. They're being, like, hidden for a while, like Vince Russo. And, but, um, the, uh, you know, Siegel was the one who made a lot of what were the ultimately really bad calls. Um, I mean, the, the original hiring of Russo, uh, in October, I guess it was, of 1999, I can't call that a bad call because at the time it actually looked like a great call. Mm -hmm. But about two months, three months later, when it was obvious that it was not a good call, pretty much every call that he made after that turned out to be pretty bad. I mean, the um, actually Bill Bush was the one who, who got rid of Russo and Siegel backed him up. But then Bischoff and Russo were working you know, behind the scenes with Siegel and kind of uh, backstab. I don't want to say backstab Bush. It was just Bush was failing too. So yeah, they, they got back in, but that decision to put them back in when you have two guys who, I mean, I, remember, I, I can remember on this show when that thing started. I mean, we were going seven weeks tops before those two had a blow up. I mean, it, it, they just couldn't work together. And, and if like we seven could say, days. Yeah, but if we could say that, if we could go in there and go, you know, seven weeks, these guys are going to be at each other's throats for all the obvious reasons. The idea of putting them back to, in there together in power, I mean, that just shows how how foolish it was. And then that was. You know, that was the period that destroyed the company. You know, like, you know, that just was the period that destroyed the company. And ever, ever since then, it's just never gotten back on track. And we can talk about that. Um, I don't know. I was saw like, like this morning in the New York Daily News, um, 
Marshall Fink had his column on, uh, you know, just about, um, they pegged the purchase price, by the way, at between 10 and 20 million, which is, I'm not surprised, that's about where I figured it, and it's such a sad number, considering, um, you know, Fusion was about to pay 48.7 million for the same property, you know, all of, what, two weeks ago. Yeah, but their 48.7 was including the TV. Without oh, that course. TV, I don't know if it was worth more than 10 million. Well, it is to Vince. Yeah. You know, potentially. I mean, potentially. But to anybody else. Uh, to anyone else starting on it's not. Not without the TV. Absolutely not. Um, so, you know, I mean, the thing that, that is, is kind of weird is, you know, during this whole period when, when it was obvious the thing was going to get sold and people were writing this off as this horrible investment by Turner, you know, my feeling always was that, you know, like with a sports franchise, a lot of sports franchises lose money year after year after year. But when they sell it, the price has gone up so much. That they, you know, they end up making a profit, a big profit on their investment. And I figured mm -hmm. the eventual sales, you know, number, which you know a year ago looked to be well into the several hundreds of millions of dollars, because this was taking in more revenue than almost any professional sports franchise, except for something you know big like Manchester United or the Yankees or, you know, someone like that. I mean, when you're talking about a company taking in, you know, 150 million to 200 million dollars a year, that's a substantial amount of money. Um, that this thing was going to go for several hundred million dollars, and that would offset whatever you know year by year losses and and the big year, the big couple of year profits, um, that the Turner, the Turner side would actually make money at the end. But you know, I mean, they bought it for like nine million, they sold it for let's say ten or fifteen, and the losses were a lot more than the gains, and they did not make money at all on this on this adventure after uh, thirteen years. Mm -hmm. um, but now I guess the. Uh, the story that went on is that uh, Ted Turner bought the company in 1988 uh, solely to drive Vince McMahon out of business. That was his entire motivation, which is so totally untrue. And I mean, it's just going to be—I just have a feeling. It's kind of been the big story for a while, though, hasn't it? Well, the fake story from Vince McMahon, it has been, of course. But it's yeah. like you know, but I mean, anyone who like looks back at anything of what was going on in '88, you know, I mean, that was so obviously not the case, and even more so. If Ted Turner really wanted to put Vince McMahon out of business, um, I'm not saying he could have done it because I don't know that he could have, but he could have crippled Vince McMahon in the early 90s just by spending money for all of Vince's talent. I mean, he could have outbid. He had a hundred times more money, or yeah, you know, a hundred times more money than Vince. He could have outbid him for every single wrestler worth it. You know, they they could have gotten Hogan, Savage, Piper when they were still young. Er. They could have gotten every, you know, everyone anytime they wanted. Vince, Vince had nobody on guaranteed money contracts except for maybe Hogan, and um, they didn't. The fact that they didn't says that they were just looking for cheap programming and to keep that programming on the air. That was their goal. It was not until Bischoff was there that anyone in management did anything that would look to be that they were, you know, up until that point they were afraid of competing with Vince McMahon. If you want to know the truth, and Bischoff was the first one who wasn't afraid to compete with Vince McMahon. At that point, they really did compete. They competed hard, and, and, you know, I mean, whether the goal was to put Vince out of business or build their company up to be the biggest possible, I mean, you know, it was a little bit, I'm sure that there was a little bit of both in that motivation, you know, in those years, 95 through 98, I guess. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I mean, that has nothing to do with 1988. I think it was almost all just the desire to put Vince out of business, because if it was just a desire to make the company as big as possible, there's so many things that they did that they would not have done if that was their, you know, sole intent or even their main intent. In, in, in there were so many hot-shotting deals and, you know, putting guys no, but, on TV. But that, that, but that was just because they didn't know how to, they didn't understand wrestling. I mean, yeah. that was, that was, I mean, don't get me wrong. There was a period where, you know, when the ratings were close, you know, they were, you know, but both sides did this. Both sides, when those, when that year when the ratings were close, they were both doing, you know, total desperation tactics, you know, for week-by-week -week ratings. And Bischoff, quite frankly, did the dumber ones because you know they gave away Goldberg and Hogan for free, which is the the most obvious one. But um, you know both sides were competing like that um, during that period. I, I I mean I'm not saying Bischoff didn't want Vince out of business as like a feather in his cap, um, but putting Vince out of business theoretically, um, if he had done that, um, I mean I think that the whole the whole motivation was still to build the company as big as possible, and he built it up big and then collapsed it because he didn't know how to sustain it and. Uh, didn't understand, you know what? You know that, that giving people bad shows and when people leave the buildings happy in in a business that's you know like this, ultimately that kills you. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see what else. The only other. What about the New York today. Post story. Uh, which the one by um, what was her name again? 
Um, the New York Post story. Oh, that. Um, oh, oh, oh. That was that was just stupid. That was the one where they said that um, that uh, that they treated that thing where Vince McMahon said that Ted Turner was going to come to WrestleMania and give him the contract. They treated that like it was a news story. I mean, it's so funny. I'm reading this thing. And then they go, you know, Turner side could not be reached for comment. And the WWF said that we do not comment, something, something along the lines of we do not comment on storylines. And then they still printed it like it was a news story. No, I, think I, the actual, I think the actual thing was they don't, they don't comment on people's comments inside the ring or something to that nature. Uh, well, characters or something along the lines of characters. Yeah, characters comments inside the yeah, because it's storyline, it's fiction. And they took it as like... You think that comment would sort of give away that it wasn't actually going to happen? Well, I think anyone with a brain would know that it wasn't going to happen. <laughs> you know, so... And the funny I mean, thing is, exactly. even in the storyline, even in the storyline, Vince said that he was going to come deliver the contract. And at the end of the show, Shane revealed he'd already signed the contract. So, you know, even in the storyline, yeah. Ted Turner wasn't going to show up. Yeah, I know. So, uh, let's see what else. Uh, Johnny Red Shoes Dugan passed away, actually, on Monday. Uh, who was? I, I think he was probably the most famous wrestling referee of the 1970s. Uh, just because the Los Angeles promotion had a lot of na had had probably more national, well they did have they had more national syndication than anybody else in that era because uh, they were on the Spanish International Network and um, he had a good nickname John you know Red Shoes Dug and he always had the red shoes and also he refereed a lot for New Japan Pro Wrestling so um I think it'd be safe to say that you know him and Joe Higuchi were the two most famous you know referees in the world during that period uh, I, I, no one else was even close I don't think because none of the None of the WF referees were really known outside of the WWF. I, Dick Kroll had a little bit of a name. Uh, Stu Schwartz in Florida, but you know, again, these are all the regional names. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see. Look at the poll here. Um, who would you ha hire as lead announcer for World Championship Wrestling? And people are going, how come I didn't put Joey Styles on the list? And the reason is, is that I think that pretty much it's not a real consideration, as far as I can tell. So why put someone? You know, the names that we put on the list. Our names that I thought were the five most logical, not logical, but most likely choices. Tony Schiavone got 22% of the vote, which is much higher than I expected. Hmm. Scott Hudson was the leader with 35%. Mike Tanay had 23%. Kevin Kelly, 7%. And Michael Cole, 14%. Today's question is, uh, with, will, how will the cancellation of WCW programming affect the time you spend watching wrestling? A, you will spend more time watching WWF. B, spend more time watching independent wrestling. C, spend more time watching international wrestling. D will spend less time watching wrestling, and E stopped watching WCW a long time ago, so it will have no effect. So, I think with me it's going to be a little bit of B and C, a little more independent wrestling, probably a lot more international wrestling. Anything else you want to talk about before we start hitting emails? Because we certainly have a ton of those. I don't think so. Anything as far as uh, I mean, I, I, you know, as far as like you know, anything further as far as talent and things like that. I mean, nobody has heard anything. Just, just so you know, I mean, I've talked, I know Brian has as well. We've talked to several different wrestlers from WCW, and, and the reality is is none of the WCW wrestlers have heard anything substantial from the WWF or from WCW as it regards their contract. I mean, there's been stuff that's been rumored and, and stuff like that. And, I mean, we've printed stuff and talked about stuff that, you know, has been talked about by the WWF and has been talked about by WCW. But the wrestlers are totally, as far as any official word, they're in the dark. I've talked to, you know, several people who... You know, are in this situation, and, and they don't know anything. And and if, if you don't know anything, um, you know, when you ask like, you know, what your decision is, how can you make a decision when when you have not been told anything? So everyone's yeah. up in the air. I've had a couple of people as well that said that anything that you read on the internet, likely about someone deciding what they're going to do at this point, is uh, probably not the case because nobody's been talked to. So. I don't yeah. think as far as final as far as final decisions, I think Goldberg uh, and Sting. Are still certainly far more likely not to do anything. I mean, and, Na and Na as far as Nash, Nash has publicly said that he's not doing anything. Yeah. But, but again, but all this can change. I mean, if WWE wants any of those guys and gives them a good offer, they'll all come. I mean, every single yeah. one of them, if, if they give them, if they want them bad enough. And if they don't want them bad enough, um, then they won't. I mean, it's, everything's really in the WWF's hands. I mean, in, in all of these things. You know, it's not in the rest. The wrestlers have, you know, they got to look out for themselves, but I mean, when it comes to the decision, Vince will make the decision for them, but based on how much he wants them. You know, they're not. None of them are really going to be making any decisions. I don't think. Mm -hmm. Okay. No. Let's go. Do you suspect that between XFL games running along and WWE's new time slot opposite Saturday Night Live, Lauren Michaels regrets the day he ever heard the name Vince McMahon? Um, I think he regretted that about week three. Yeah. I. I. I but see, I don't think. 
and and maybe you know things will change. I don't think for one second anyone at NBC and Lauren Michaels care that WCW wrestling is going to go on TNN, which they don't even consider their competitor, on Saturday night as as a factor of the ratings of Saturday Night Live. Now it it may turn out to be some day, um, you know, but I don't think that they care. Now as far as the XFL, yeah, you know, I mean that that one we, you know. Lorne Michaels doesn't like it because, you know, he was promised by Dick Ebersole that he was going to get big lead-in ratings and was going to help, and it turned out that they're getting the worst lead-in ratings in the history of television, and it's not helping. So, yeah, you know, he probably regrets. Uh, I think if, if WCW ever grew to the point where it was actually going to be a rating threat Saturday Night Live, they'd move it to a better time slot first. Uh, yeah, TN yeah, yeah, that's right. If it ever turns into a hit, TNN's going to put it in prime time anyway. You're absolutely right. So it, it will really... If it ever affects Saturday Night Live, it's going to be for like six weeks. Because as soon as it's a hit, they're getting it out of that slot. You're right. You're totally right. Uh, let's see. I don't know if you read Russo's Internet statement that he has no intention of returning to the WWF. <laughs> yeah, I read it, and I believe that he was begging for a job. That's how no, I read it. That wasn't exactly what he said. It was more along the lines of, I have... If they, uh, need, if they need me, you know, I'm always here for you, Vince. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So... Uh, of course he's not see. coming back now. They don't want him. Yeah. Listening to the King Show last night, I think Vince let both he and the cat go on purpose. It's purely because he had made a business decision. He felt he no longer needed the services of the cat and Jerry anymore. It's simply business. Vince does what's best for business. End of story. Uh, Vince does whatever he wants to do. I don't think he even thinks about... Uh, I don't know I say that. That's not fair. I think he thinks about business, but right now I think that he... His motivation is not business at all in any of this stuff. His motivation is that he can do what he wants and he does what he wants. Do you think... Uh, just, just an example as far as business decision. When you're going to say that, I mean, and this is not a defense of Lawler whatsoever, okay? If he thought that Heyman was better than Lawler, and this was his way of getting rid of Lawler nicely, that's fine. There's no way, okay, nicely. but that's even, but you know what, but that's ridiculous, because there's no way anyone's going to tell me that anyone thinks Taz is better than Lawler. You can make mm -hmm. the argument for Heyman, not Taz. So as far as, is it better? No. No. Is, is the product better on Tuesdays because Lawler's not on the show? You can argue it may, may be better on Monday, even though the ratings don't show it, but I don't think the announcers have anything to do with the ratings anyway. Now, as far as um, what I say, as far as the uh, the Memphis situation, you tell me how it is better for business that the developmental guys no longer have a live television show to practice their craft on a, a very well-rated live television show in Memphis, to practice their craft, and to learn how to get over in front of real viewers. Um, why? For what reason? How is that beneficial? This is all spite, and you can't argue that one differently. Well, someone like I mean, Jerry Lawler there to help them. Yeah, Jerry Lawler is not. I know that's that's the other part of it is just like there's so much to learn between Bobby Eaton and Jerry Lawler. That is like the two greatest different people to be in a company with those guys because everybody loves. I mean, a lot of people don't know who Bobby Eaton is because of, but everything, but. Bob Eaton is a is, is a high flying guy who did everything in the ring, so he knows when to tell guys don't do this because it'll shorten your career. Do this this way. Um, he's the nicest guy in wrestling, um, and you know he's a quiet guy and all that. And then Jerry Lawler, uh, I mean, is golden throat. I mean, he's the one who knows. I mean, you watch Jerry Lawler do an interview and do a promo, you will learn how to do a promo. I mean, you, you watch you know people talk about Cornette or, or Heyman and all these guys. That, are, that were good on interviews, they all learned. I mean, they learned from a lot of guys. But I can tell you, Cornette learned more from Lawler, and, and you watch Heyman, he learned a lot from Lawler, too. The guy, you know, and those guys, like, you know, just as a name, like Pete Gass or Rodney, they want to learn how to do an interview. It's a hell of a lot better, learn, you know, with, with Jerry Lawler there than, you know, learning from each other, so to speak, you know, like, so anyway, yeah. Anyway, what was I going to say? Uh, that's pretty much it. Let's see. Where did you go to college and what was your major? Major in journalism at San Jose State. Anyway, were the, when the writers of WF write the show, what did they actually write? They basically script, script out uh, the interviews, um, you know, leave time Segments. for the matches. What? Segments. Yeah. The, the, you, know, the, um, you know, just like, you know, cut off time for, for matches, basically. And, you know, it's, a lot of it's done as it goes because live television, you can't time it perfectly anyway. And kind of go through like the basics of the storylines. Uh, let's see. It's obvious from listening to Jerry Lawler's comments on yesterday's show that the reason Vince fired Stacy was because he wanted to get rid of both of them. Vince had no place for them anymore in his super promotion, and this was an easy way to send them packing. I think Vince is a gentleman not to say to the king the real reason for firing the cat is this would hurt his feelings as well as the cat's. 
Think about it. It's not easy for Vince to dump people just because they have no place in the company, but you can't keep people who are no longer needed, especially in this industry. It just doesn't work money-wise. Okay, now why would Lawler not I don't know about that line about it's thing? not easy for Vince to dump people. No, because he did it very easily on Monday night. Uh, let's see. While I agree... Okay, I'll go with one more. While I agree that putting WCW in the heat slot would be a good short-term alternative, it has flaws. Every month, WWF would lose its lead-in. Uh, WWF pay-per-view would lose its lead-in, while WCW would have to move the show up one hour. No, we were talking about six to eight. I think six to eight on MTV would be a great slot, and it, and it could work as a lead-in because they could use that two hours. In fact, I think it would be better, and I'll tell you why. Because they could use those two, the two-hour show the night of the pay-per-view to constantly plug that the pay-per-view is going on without going to the arena and having to do the, that, that live stuff for an hour that kind of, you know, makes it, t you know, the fans are sitting there for too long because of that first hour. So I think, uh, you know what I'm saying? It's kind of weird, though, as far as trying to keep the two promotions separate, you know, to have a WCW show where throughout they're promoting the WWF pay-per-view that's coming up next. Well, Super Astros did that. You know, they were a separate promotion, but when I used to watch Super Astros, all they did for every commercial break was plug the WWE pay-per-views. But they weren't really you know, just a competition. You know, these guys aren't competition either. Everyone knows they're owned by the same person. I mean, it's public knowledge. Yeah, but that's like the whole deal with, you know, Hall and Nash. Everybody knew they were under contract, but, you know, it didn't hurt the storyline that they were there to invade and take over. But they were on the same show. And if there was mm -hmm. an NWO, if there was an NWO television show, as had been you know, talked about, you know, for a long time, did you make Thunder the NWO show? And thankfully they never did it because it would have been a total flop. But if they had done that, would they have not plugged the pay-per-views on that show? Of course they would. So, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't see why plugging, talking about the pay-per-view coming up takes away from anything that people don't already know. I mean, it's already, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm just kind of looking at it like it's going to be, it won't really be competition, but if Shane's going to be over there, that's the way they're going to consider it. And, you know, if they but had Shane's the NWO TV show for Thunder, they could plug a WCW pay-per-view because those guys would be on the pay-per-view. Okay, now you tell me that you think that TNN show will never mention, all, will not be plugging the WF pay-per-views. They'll be talking about the WF pay-per-views on the television show anyway, in the, in the, in the 11 o'clock time slot. They're not going to oh, give yeah. up those two hours not to plug that pay-per-view. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Just tell everybody the press release that they sent out yesterday about WrestleMania. The headline was that Vince McMahon and Shane McMahon would have the battle of the father and son at WrestleMania this year. No mention of Rock and Austin until the first paragraph. That's right. So we have, um, <laughs> well, what can you say? I'll tell you what, for, I don't think that the Rock Austin match has really been promoted that great, even though it's going to do a big numbers just because Rock and Austin, it, it couldn't fail. I mean, it really, it couldn't, but, um, they, the one, you know, a couple weeks ago when they did the thing with, Actually, the thing where Kurt Angle put the ankle lock on and Austin ended up stunning Rock. I thought that was really good. Since then, like, none of the interviews or anything like that have really gotten me jazzed. And then the, the WCW news, you know, and everything, so overwhelmed. It, not that it's not going to do well. It'll do great. The show's going to be, I mean, you know, I expect the show to be, you know, a fantastic show. I expect it to be the greatest WrestleMania ever. I, You know, it may not be, but I'm, eh, I'm expecting that. I just anyway. kind of think there's something about the fact that Rock just won that title, you know? I think he should have uh, had it for at least three or four months or, you know, some period of time. Now it's like Austin's coming to win this. It's just like he's coming to win the title. It's not like he's coming to beat The Rock, because Rock just won the title. Yeah. You're right, Rock. Where should... Rock is built up as this long-term champion, and Austin's finally getting a shot at the title and at Rock. And now it's just like, eh, I want that belt, and I don't like yeah. you. Yeah. I agree. I mean, we, we've talked about it before. I think we all think Rock should have won the belt a little bit earlier. Uh, let's see. Out of all the gimmicks in the gimmick battle royal, where the hell is Outback Jack and Ted RCD? Hopefully, still a couple find. of days left. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if they're going to find that. Well, Outback Jack, who the hell is that? They had a one man here? gang and Duke Drozzi. Yeah, they got added. Uh, but that means, I want, you know, they're going to use him as a one man gang and not a keem, which is interesting because I think more people wanted him as a keem. Just because it was such a horrible gimmick. Uh, let's see. Maybe you can is enter Jerry twice. Lynn, yeah. Is Jerry Lynn still likely to appear on WF soon, or will they save him for WCW where he might be a better fit? I think that that's all being worked out. I mean, he was a TV Monday and Tuesday, but they didn't use him. So, um, you know, I don't know why the, you know, I, obviously there was a plan to use, to bring him, or to use him at TV, because they brought him there, and they just didn't. We got a lot of questions about Shawn Michaels and, uh, if he's going to be at Mania, and I don't know the answer, um, so, so, can't give an answer. Um, you know, I mean, just, 
he didn't endear himself. His, he did not play his politics very smartly by showing up on showing up in in less than 100 percent condition after all those months of not being around. Uh, that was not very good timing on his part. Uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. What do you think about unifying the WWF, WCW, and ECW heavyweight titles to create a triple crown? I think that they're not even going to bother with the ECW. As far as uh, WCW and WWF, you know, they'll, they'll, the day will come when they unify it. I think that's, but hopefully that's 12 to 18 months away. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, Beyond the Mat will be on. They are mentioning that Rhino's a former champion, though. Yeah, but they don't really, you know, it's not portrayed like it's any big deal. In fact, they yeah. pretty much say, like, the last champion. Like, it's not like he doesn't really have, like, he didn't come out with a belt or anything like that. Yeah. So I think, and, you know, you know, I think that it's just one of those things where, you know, Paul Heyman acknowledges it, but it's not like they announce him as, you know, like when he comes to the ring for his match on SmackDown, it's not like they're going to announce him as ECW World Heavyweight Champion Rhino. Mm-hmm. So, you know what I think so was funny they, was uh, last week in the Ross Report, Jim Ross is talking about how they need to do a better job Sort of, they need to do a better job talking about the whole uh, ECW deal and you know promoting it or whatever. And uh, this is from the same guy that every time Paul Heyman even mentions it, he just totally ignores him. Yeah, I think that they don't know. Well, you know what? You know, part of that's also um, there's there's two communities. There's the the ECW community, which I think everyone sees the internet as, which is probably some truth to. And then there's the big TV audience, which I think everyone sees that really nobody in the big TV audience, the majority of the viewers, don't even know anything about ECW. So I think he's, I don't know, he's playing for each audience maybe, I don't know. He says, Beyond the Mat will be on Stars East at 11.35 p.m. Eastern and Stars West at 2.35 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, we go, we got Brock, Brock, Brock Lesnar on the line. This is uh, Brock Lesnar. Year 2000 NCAA champion, currently wrestling for Ohio Valley Wrestling. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you guys doing? We're doing really good. Um, you know what? You know, I, I guess just to give everyone a little bit of background on on you, uh, you wrestled at University of Minnesota, and uh, I think what took second in the NCAA's in '99, and you won it in 2000. Yep. And. and um, when you were like, you when when you graduated from, in fact, I, I should even go back. When you were a junior in college. That was the first I had heard about, you know, Brock Lesnar would make a great pro wrestling prospect. I guess it's probably because of the physique, you know. And when were you first approached and, and uh, what made, you know, I, I, I guess you, you actually talked with both WF and WCW before going WWF. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I did. I was approached in uh, about uh, January of uh, 1999 by uh, Gerald Briscoe and, uh, and then also uh, Jim Ross. And uh, they just approached me, and they knew that I had uh, some, another year of uh, eligibility left in wrestling. They just wanted to know that uh, they wanted to let me know that I was that they were interested in me, and um, that uh, they would be contacting me in the near future. And and uh, and you know, I, I had another year left, so I told them that I wasn't uh, wasn't available for another year and a half. And even after that, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do yet. If I wanted to go wrestle and uh, try to make the Olympic team, and so on and so forth. So. Um, but they just told me that to, to you know that they called me every now and then and reminded me that they were still interested in me and 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 wanted to sign me on a deal and stuff and and I and I was uh, I had I was just weighing my options and waiting to you know finish school so I had something to fall back on you know my my parents always said that was, that you know I need to finish my my college degree and and which I did and so and were uh, you a big fan growing up. I actually, um, I never watched a lot of professional wrestling mm -hmm. um, because uh, I, I grew up on the farm in South Dakota, and we just didn't uh, have a lot of time for it. I didn't have the time for TV, as a matter of fact. So uh, until I got to college, uh, you know, in '96 is when I really started watching professional wrestling. You and know? what were your? Uh, so I assume you were a fan of it because we had like Kurt Angle on. He's talking about a lot of the. Um the amateur guys, you know, they look down on pro wrestling. Some of them don't, but most of them do, so, you know. Yeah, a lot of, like, in in my wrestling room at the University of Minnesota, um, professional wrestling was, was not very uh, admired, you know. I mean, it was something that, uh, it's just the amateur attitude, you know, um, because mm -hmm. most of the professional wrestlers, like, you know, were, were never amateur wrestlers, you know, and, and except for, 
uh, Kurt Angle, and there's a few, you know, I don't even know, maybe if uh, Dr. Death maybe was one, or and uh, Vern Gagne, you know, maybe just a few, a handful of guys were amateur wrestlers or whatever, and and so it was just something that, I guess it was the amateur attitude, you know, those guys, that that's not wrestling, you know, because uh, in the amateur eyes, um, there's so much, and now at me, uh, be, only about seven months into professional wrestling, professional wrestling, it takes a lot of skill and hard work and, and so on and so forth, and me as an amateur wrestler, uh, put we put so much time into you know, and we get so so less respect for our sport in amateur. You know, I think that that uh, the the public in the public eye, uh, the fake wrestling got more attention than the real wrestling, and I think that's why a lot of amateurs had a bad attitude towards it. Mm -hmm. Now, how is how is mentally? Because you're going from when you go from the amateur world to the professional world, you're going from a world where the worst possible thing is to lose to a world where you, if you let losing bother you, you'll, you'll drive yourself crazy because it's it's kind of immaterial. How how how, is, how I mean, could you, are you were you able to switch it on off? Because a lot of a lot of athletes, you know, good athletes, that losing thing is real hard for them to accept. But but in pro wrestling, you just kind of have to. Yeah, um, I guess when I hung my singlet up and you know threw my shoes in the closet. I was retired, you know, I, I, I gave up the wrestling, the sport of wrestling as an amateur wrestler, and uh, it's just like being in the business world, you know, so you're going to win, you're going to lose someone, you know, in business or whatever, you know, so to me, it, to me it's, um, <clears throat> I have no problem putting somebody over, you know, I, I have no problem with that at all, you know, I'm, it's just, um, I get paid the same either way, so it doesn't bother me, you know, and I guess it, it's something... It, that hasn't affected me yet, and I don't really think uh, that it will. You know? How would you compare the amateur wrestling training with the pro wrestling training? Uh, repeat the question. I didn't hear you. How would you compare the amateur wrestling training with your pro wrestling training? Um, I would say that uh, the training in the amateur level is is uh, very very um, demanding, uh, and also so is the professional level on the, on your body, but. Mentally and physically, and, and um, I mean, we we practice you know three to four times a day. Whether it was you know running, lifting, drilling, wrestling, it's very very demanding on the body. I mean, it's it's something that, uh, that it's totally different than any other sport because by the time you put it this way, you go through the NCAA tournament and you feel like you that. By the third day of wrestling, you just want to fall fall over and die because I mean it's so it's so you know vigorous. I mean it's just demanding on your body and mentally drain yourself. And most of wrestling, amateur wrestling, is about eighty percent mental. You know, you can go out and, and have yourself beat before you even step on the mat. You know, it's just, it's a mental game and and it's it's kind of like playing chess. You know, but it's it's so physical and and uh, very demanding. I mean, a lot of guys. Unless you're a very good athlete, um, I started amateur wrestling when I was in kindergarten, you know, and it took me 19 years to become an NCAA champion, you know, and I was never even a state champion in high school, or, you know, so it took me a long time to, to actually uh, excel at the at the sport, you know. So, I mean, and, and, and to the same, too, as professional wrestling, you know. Um, granted, I'm very athletic, and, and I think that I move very well in the ring and stuff, but uh, it's... This is totally different. I mean, this is, uh, you gotta put psychology into things, you gotta, you know, on, you ring awareness, you gotta understand, the, you know, you said everybody's gotta be on the same page, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, th this, becoming a professional wrestler has been very demanding on me also, you know, so I'm saying that the both, both sports, uh, um, <clears throat> back to back is, is very different for me and, and has been, has been, uh, what I expected it to be and what I what it is uh, is totally two different things. You know, I thought it, I had no idea it'd be be like this. You know, I had no clue, <laughs> and I'm enjoying every day of it. Now, in your senior year, or what at what point in your life, you know, you're going through amateur wrestling, and I mean, there's the chance. You know, it's the year 2000, so it's Olympic year. There are a lot of the guys. I mean, um, going for the Olympic team. I mean, you're not a shoo for the Olympic team, but certainly you would have been in the hunt. Yeah. When did you when did you make the decision that 
you know, I'm not going to go to the Olympics. I'm going to go right to pro wrestling. Um, I mean, it was just that the, the NCAA tournament was just so draining, and then that was like, okay, that's it. Um, or, or, and, and when did you make, like, like, at what point did you make the decision I'm going into pro wrestling after think, the season's over? I think um, once I achieved my, the ultimate goal in my life, which was being a national champion, I think that pretty much decided it for me. If I would have ended up second place at the NCAA tournament, I would probably be wrestling still because it, really? it would be an empty spot in my life where I needed to fill. You know, uh, if I would have ended up second place, I would definitely be uh, be in Minneapolis training for the U.S. Olympic team. And uh, But I think once I won that tournament, it was like a, a big weight was lifted off of me, and I just... I didn't care. I, I I could care less about even putting my wrestling shoes ever, back on ever again. Wow! Because no, it was what? just so draining. I mean, it was uh, that my senior year at the University of Minnesota was uh, due to the media and the hype and and just how uh, Jay Robinson, my head coach, just built me up to be some somebody that I tried to be, and I and I very well uh, uh, played the part very well. You know. Um, they built me up to this, you know, un unstoppable machine, you know, and and the media in Minneapolis uh, just kind of caught on to it. And it, before you knew it, I was, I had my own radio show in Minneapolis, and before I knew it, I was in the, in the newspaper and Lesnar Leeds University of Minnesota, you know, this that and the other thing. And before you knew it, uh, I had mentioned something about football that I was gonna, you know, I had, a, I wanted to play football because I had another year of eligibility left. And then, you know, once the word football got out there, the media just, you know, they just, it just started snowballing. And then they, they caught the, that the WWF was interested in me, and then they caught that WCW was interested in me. And, but finally, come about a month before the NCAA tournament, I, I told Jay Robinson, uh, I just, I can't handle this anymore. If I'm going to win this tournament, I need to be left alone. And, and, uh, and which which finally we cut off all the media, all, my radio show, everything, and, and uh, it just finally came down to where nothing was more important to me than winning the NCAA tournament. And I'm glad that I look back, and I think that was the right decision for, that I made and, and that Jay made for me. I, I guess I guess you're probably feeling really good about this decision as well right now, because uh, when you were uh, done with college, you had offers from both WWF and WCW. And uh, what made you choose WWF? Um. I think just the professionalism of uh, when I went to meet with uh, Jim and uh, Vince, and just uh, I wanted to be with a, 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 a top-notch business because I'd always been surrounded by. Um, I always tried to surround myself with, you know, to, to fly with the Eagles. You know, I always wanted to be around people that that always had big goals, and, and that's why I chose the University of Minnesota. Also, you know, is because I. Uh, they were they were building a destiny and, and just as as Vince McMahon is you know I think uh, with him buying out uh, WCW and, and everything which I had no idea at the time but um, just the pure the the kind the nice people and and uh, the professionalism and and that's probably one of the, the biggest things that I that I felt I felt at home with with them guys. Who did you talk with in WCW? Um, I talked with uh, Eric Bischoff and. Uh, <laughs> Mostly him, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, Paul Orndorff also. What you know, as far as um, did you were you following the NCAs this year, and you know the Minnesota ended up winning the national championship. Yeah, or, or, yeah. You, oh, you followed it pretty close. Yep, yeah. Uh, uh, like you know, I'm, I'm very good friends with uh, all those guys on the team yet, you know, and and I followed them match by match as much as I could, and, and I was I was disgusted with, with myself that I couldn't have been there, but um, due to you know. I'm, I'm here now, and I'm in the I'm in the real world. <laughs> so <laughs> it was hard for me to get back, and I wish I could have attended that, but I could, it was impossible. For me. But yeah, having ten All Americans uh, for the first time ever in a NCAA uh, Division One wrestling tournament, uh, the University of Minnesota did a, a fine job of, of pulling it off. What do some of your friends and former okay. teammates have to say about you going into uh, pro wrestling? Oh, they're excited. Um, everybody. Every, pretty much everybody that I, that I know it was very supportive supportive of me. I mean, because um, they, most of them are fans of it, and most of them um, are excited to hopefully to someday see me on on, on TV. You know, and um, I, I had lots of lots of support. 
What's uh what? No, I want to talk a little bit about Shelton Benjamin, who's your tag team partner, yeah. and also he was your he was your coach at Minnesota, right? Um, yeah, he wrestled at the University of Minnesota. He uh, was a two-time All-American for the University of Minnesota. Um, I was recruited after him. Uh, he was, I think, his last year was in '98, and then I came, and then he was a grad assistant in '99, and also uh, some in 2000. Uh, he was a gra- graduate assistant uh, coach there, and uh, did lots of uh, amateur wrestling. I'm, yeah, I've known Shelton uh, in the amateur ranks for probably uh, ever since 1996. So I've known of him, and, and uh, but we've never actually wrestled in a competitive match. You know, it was just kind of ironic how we ended up on the same team. It was, uh, but yeah, we trained together for uh, two and a half years in the amateur ranks. So, now in, in Ohio Valley, um, who are the guys? Are there are, are, like who are the guys that you have really li- learned from as far as uh, you know some of the guys that have been there for a long time and what type of stuff are you trying to pick up from different guys that are there right now? Um, uh, Dean Davis has been a, a, a very very big help to me and and um, I think just uh, um, also you know Jim Clonet psychology wise and uh, trying to learn everything I try to take as much advice uh, as I can from everybody. And try to try to mold it in, and try to make make it make sense in my mind, you know. And uh, everybody, I would say, you know, like the Nick Densmores and and uh, the Flash uh, Flanagans here at uh, Ohio Valley Wrestling are are some of the guys that I like to to watch, and and if I can learn from from them, um, uh, they, which they, they're very uh, they can be entertaining, and, and they've been around here for uh, you know four or five years, and and so they. They know pretty much how to how to work around here, and, and I think those guys have been a big help to me. Well, how was uh, the working on the January 30th show? Because you know you've been wrestling um, as far as like the professional before, you know, relatively small crowds, and then all of a sudden you're out there in front of over 5,000 people. You're on the same show with Steve Austin. Jim Ross is there. Yeah. Uh, you did the Shooting Star Press in like one of the first matches on the show, and yeah. kind of like nobody was really. Ex- I don't know if <laughs> people were expecting that. I'm sure, the fans were not from someone of your size. What was uh, you know, what was your feelings, you know, before that show? Um, I was very excited for that show. Um, we put a lot of time in in into that show, and and um, I just wanted to, I just wanted to show uh, Jim Ross and those guys that I'm, I'm trying my damnedest to, you know, to become a professional wrestler. And, and uh, I wanted to, to, to show, you know, also Jim Cornette and, and Danny Davis, uh, you know, that, that I'm very capable and I, uh, of doing whatever they want me to do, you know? So, but I was very excited for the show and, and, uh, me and Shelton, I think, uh, um, being very green and stuff, we worked together very well. And, and, uh, I had a, I think we had a, a, an exciting, great first uh, tag match of the night, and and we got a big pop. Uh, you know, we got big pops, and uh, it was very exciting. You know, Shelton's very athletic, and and uh, me being uh, you know almost 300 pounds, uh, uh, and and I think uh, we pretty much uh, we entertained. I hope so. <laughs> Is anybody from WWF about... talked to you about a possible time frame for moving up, or have they not even mentioned that yet? Uh, you know, I don't, I, I, I don't know, you know, I'm just, right now I'm just trying to, just, to learn every single day and, and with, with, uh, with them making some cuts and stuff down here now and, and, um, and I'm not even sure, you know, I don't, <laughs> I don't know, I'm just, I'm just doing what I'm told and, and, um, I'm not even close to being ready, you know, I don't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't assume that they'd want to bring me up, uh, you know, if I'm not ready, so and me personally, I'm not ready. I need I need a, a, a good you know six or eight more months, or you know even more than that. So I'm willing to do to do whatever it takes. I'm willing to spend the time to to uh, become the best. You know, I put 19 years in to become a, a NCAA Division One champion, and I know that to, for me to step in and even try to be a, a WWF champion, it's going to take a lot longer than a year, you know, unless you're a Kurt Angle, you know. So mm-hmm. I'm, yeah. I'm very satisfied to where I'm at right now, but I, uh, I'm i not saying that that uh, I don't set my goals higher than, than I should, you know, because that is my goal, to make, you know, to become a WWF champion. But in retrospect and, and in reality, um, I'm very happy and I'm learning, and uh, that's that's all I can ask for right now. In the amateur thing, 
Um, you know, one thing you mentioned earlier, um, your junior year in college, you were second in the NCAAs. A couple of years earlier, as a senior in high school, you were not even state champion. What happened? Was there a year or a point where all of a sudden, in your mind, you go, hey, I can beat anybody, or, you know, or a year? I mean, what, what happened in that interim? It was interim? a turning point. Yeah, it was um, a turning I point. Think, I think it's a maturity level thing. Um, I think uh, in high school, I was a, a late bloomer. I uh, When I graduated, when I was a senior in high school, I was maybe six feet tall, and, and I was lucky if I weighed 200 pounds. And then... Um, I was wrestling up against guys that were very more uh, uh, more mature than me, you know. So I I didn't really have that chance to to excel and become the person that I was supposed to be until two or three years later down the road, you know. It just took me a, a I consider myself a late bloomer, you know. So uh, by the time I was at my peak, uh, I, I I was weighing you know 275 pounds and, and I grew four inches taller, you know. I think it was a maturity thing, and I think it as I Spent more time in the weight room and spent more time surrounded by great people like uh, the, the people at the University of Minnesota and, and most of my, my trainers and coaches. They made me believe in myself, and I think it was a confidence thing. I, I think I, the turning point for me was probably my freshman year uh, at junior college when I had got beaten by this kid in the semifinals uh, who couldn't hardly – chew gum and tie his shoes at the same time <laughs> you know i was so disgusted with myself that uh that i had just gotten beat by this guy that looks like a marshmallow and uh here i had spent so many hours in the gym and so many hours running and this guy catches me you know and, and beats me out of you know a fluke you know so i think that was probably my turning point i woke up the next day and i was like you know what it's time for me to get serious it's time for you know things to change and i think that was probably my turning point right there did you ever I'm mean not asking this because you said marshmallow, but what were your thoughts on uh, oh. Gardner versus? Uh, uh, oh my oh God. yeah, Ruin Gardner and Alexander Corellin. What were you? Th- yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, I'm not a big Greco-Roman fan. Um, I never have been a big Greco fan, and I don't think I think it's a, a easy way out of wrestling. I think it's just a a, a push and shove match. Um, I've always I've always hated stallers. You know, people that hold back and and don't don't shoot or, you know, who just slide by. I hate that kind of, I hate that style of wrestling. And for, for Rulon Gardner to beat, you know, Corellin, um, in my eyes, I was happy for him, but at the same time, it was kind of disgusting at the same time because, um, <clears throat> you know, here you got a guy that was never an NCAA champion, um, you know, or just somebody that, just doesn't look to, to play the part, you know, and it doesn't have to be. That just goes to show that in Greco-Roman, you don't have to look like the Corellin to beat the Corellin, you know. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it was it was kind of disgusting and happy for him at the same time, but in retrospect and, and looking back, Corellin never should have been there, you know. Uh, Corellin uh, was past his time anyway, and I think when it comes to Olympic-level wrestling, Politics play a big part in in uh, in, in who's going to win and who's making it to the to the finals. I think that has a big big thing big big part in it because the referees um, are, are very political. <laughs> it, really? You tell, yeah. It, it's I think uh, that the refing system in the in the Olympic levels of wrestling in Greco Roman and and in freestyle because Russia is such a strong wrestling uh, um, <clears throat> country that. You know, and Corellin was built to be this person that, you know, the Frankenstein of wrestling, you know, the, the, un, the unstoppable, you know. The creation. I, yeah, you know, yeah. it was, I don't know. I'm happy for Rulon, and, and I'm happy for him and, and everything like that, but I'm not, like I said, I'm not a fan of Greco Roman, and, and um, I, I don't think that that match should have never even taken place. <laughs> did you ever, um, did you ever consider No Holds Barred fighting? With your size and everything like that? Uh, yes, I did, and I trained uh, between my uh, sophomore year and junior year because uh, I spent some time in, in California, and I spent some time uh, doing some submission fighting and, and stuff like that. But I, uh, I was gonna uh, attend a tournament in Reno actually that summer, but it would uh, mess. It was gonna mess with my eligibility for wrestling, so I couldn't. I couldn't uh, join it and be a part of it. So um, I just. By the time uh, I, when I got out of college, it was time for you know there was really no money in it, and I didn't see 
see the the uh, a good idea of me going out and you know and either getting beat up or beating somebody up for you know twelve hundred dollars or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Who did you I, train with? Um, I trained in, in uh, I I went down to the Lions Den. Uh, I sent uh, actually I was only I just I went down there and that's actually what turned me on to the wrestling was Ken Shamrock and Frank. Uh, in um, in California, I I stopped by the Lions Den one day, and and I never trained there, but I, I just that's what got me into it. And then I trained in in Lassen, Cal, uh, California. There was just a, a submission uh, little school there, and I never really trained with any top athletes, but I just spent some time with this with a submission specialist, and you know, and he kind of got me into it a little bit. And, but I never really had a heck of a lot of time because I was taking summer school and this that and the other, so it just kind of faded away. Did you ever uh, bump into Vern Gagne in Minnesota? Oh yeah, all the time. Yeah, oh, really. Vern is a big, uh, uh, a big sponsor of the you know University of Minnesota, and, and he's a big, uh, big fan of it. And, and uh, um, I met did he, Vern. Did he give you any advice as far as going into pro or what to look out for or anything? Yeah. I mean, he he did it for forever, and he promoted it, so he he knows all the, the good and bad sides. Believe yeah. Me. Yep. Yeah, um, I spent a lot of time with Vern. You know, I spent a lot of time on the phone with him, and and a lot of time at his house and, and talking to him, and and uh, you know, just um, he was gave me a lot of lot of advice, and and um, I spent a lot of time with. Uh, this was before I even signed with anybody with Kurt Hennig and, and Brad Rangins, uh, talking with those guys, and I don't know if you the 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 names Wayne Bloom and and those guys. Uh, oh yeah, um, I remember them. Yeah, I spent a lot of time talking to those guys, and and uh, and they they were a lot of help to me. Just, Did they ever know. try to hook you up with uh, J Japan wrestling? Because you know, a a, a college wrestler might have an easy. It yeah. is, it's an, it's yeah. an easier transition to Japan because they think they respect that reality more. Whereas American, it's it's more entertainment oriented. Yeah, um, Brad, who who works for New Japan, Brad Ring, and uh, um, <clears throat> actually. Uh, uh, I, I had a visit with uh, Antonio Anoki uh, in in Minneapolis. Uh, Anoki came over to visit with me and stuff. So, um, hmm. but I just wanted to stay in the states. And, yeah. Because uh, actually, you're the kind of an athlete that they would love. I mean, basically because of what the Japanese like from foreigners plus the credentials. Sure. You know. Um, I mean, you're. You know, I mean, you're kind of tailor tailor made in a lot of ways for what Anoki would Anoki's vision of pro wrestling, which is very. Mm -hmm. Different vision than that other people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not yeah. exactly sure I understand it sometimes, but I didn't. Uh, I didn't even know who Anoki was when Brad. I had been training with Brad for probably three weeks out at Brad's house, Brad Ring, and, and uh, I didn't even know he had this meeting set up for me. Brad knew that I was going to meet with uh, the WWF office, um, and so Brad, uh, being the guy that he is, he didn't want to force anything on me, but he just told me that, uh, the J New Japan office was coming in and, and, uh, they, they wanted to meet with me. And I had no clue who Antonio Anoki was. And, uh, Brad put me in the ring with him and we started shooting on each other. And Brad was, <laughs> it was just, it was almost comical. And I had no idea who he was. And, uh, Brad was just in the back of his mind, you know, playing a, uh, a joke on me, you know, and and uh, and so me and Anoki wrestled for about an hour and a half straight, uh, really? just doing submission stuff and and uh, and trying to make each other, you know, pin each other and submit, and and it was kind of comical. And then at the end, uh, you know, Brad informed me on who he was and and what was going on, and so yeah, he played a pretty big rib on me. So. <laughs> what was your thoughts of being in there? Because you know Inoki's like almost sixty years old, although he's in great shape for his age. He's in excellent shape. Yeah, he's a he's a machine, man. Um, I tell you, yeah, he's he's. I, it was just now I look back and it'll be one of those things where twenty years from now I look back and just laugh about at it, you know, because it was it was so comical and and I had no I had no clue. Here I am, this you know this college wrestler, <laughs> I had no idea who Antonio Inoki was, so. Twenty years from now, you may be wrestling him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that, but I think he's done that. But. And we've got a couple of emails. We're going to get to the phone calls right after this. This is from Rick Baker, who goes, Have you ever met Kurt Angle or Luthez? Uh, I've met Kurt Angle, but I've never met Luthez before. And, and um, um, Kurt, uh, I think I've met Kurt 
uh, in amateur. Uh, I went to one of his camps, and, uh, like back in ninety two. It was quite like ninety three. That was the first time I ever met Kurt, and then before the, after that, I had met him uh, at the uh, house show in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So, if that answers your question, but never never lose that before. No. What what do the people in amateur wrestling feel about Kurt Angle? Because I know at the beginning, I mean, I, I actually follow amateur fairly close, and I know at the beginning it was almost like they when he first went into pro wrestling, it was like they just didn't even acknowledge it. I mean, well, at all. It was like, what, what, what and now all of a sudden, now all of a sudden, it's like everyone's like, oh wow, you know, this is great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 that uh, old analogy, you know. It's like uh, jumping on the bandwagon, you know. I mean, it's it, what could they say? What can they say now? Of course, they're going to say horrible things. Uh, uh, I'm glad Kurt uh, went and did what he did and has gotten to where he has gotten uh, because. Um, it made it easier on us amateur guys, a heck of a lot easier, you know, to follow in his footsteps. But uh, they can't say nothing about, you know, stepping in and, and a year and a half later being a, the WWF champion. And and uh, I'm I'm very happy for Kurt, and I think that it's it's great that you know somebody uh, that that somebody that knows the amateur people and and the the way of life, the amateur life, and and can become a WWF champion. I think it's great, but. As far as people talking down about him, you know, now, of course, they're not going to know, you know. I mean, uh, he's become successful at it, you know, and they definitely were going to turn their backs on him if he wasn't successful. That's just the way people are, you know, and I think it's it's great. I'm happy for Kurt. You know, he, he really changed a lot of minds because, you know, I would say through probably through the 60s, mid-60s, a lot of uh, amateur wrestlers went into pro and, and were very successful, like Vern Gagne, Jack Briscoe, Dick Hutton, you know, um, Ray Gunkel. I mean, there's just a little Danny Hodge. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just a one, you know, one after Gorilla Monsoon, one after another. And then around in the mid-60s, the mentality in pro wrestling was, for a lot of various different reasons, that amateur wrestlers didn't make good pros. And they kind of, you know, and there were a few that came in. Um, you know, Steve Williams did pretty well, Gary, Al late Gary Albright, but, but very few, actually. And then uh, Angle came in. And it opened the doors for you and Sylvester Turkai, who's also in Ohio Valley, and um, it's Shelton Benjamin, and, and just like they really like. Uh, I, I think that that it, it's just kind of interesting that one guy just coming in and being so successful is all of a sudden people are going like, oh, you know, like, uh, yeah, you know, go, you know, maybe looking at like a, a top amateur. I mean, I know like with Jim Ross. I mean, his mentality is is that if you're a top level amateur wrestler that you're used to a lot of dedication and a lot of sacrifice without necessarily a lot of gain monetarily, and you're not going to cry about, you know, uh, your fingernail being broken, and, and, you know, you're basically going to be a tough guy if you can make it to that level, and, and he thinks that that's the kind of a people that, you know, in the WWF it's a different kind of punishment, but, you know, you got to be able to take pain and not cry about it. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, it, and uh, I think what one thing that was very important for, for Jim Ross when, when uh, I met with him was the fact that, what you said, the, the amateur level people, uh, no dedication. They have a, they have a lot of heart. They they know what it is to to be dedicated. Um, they're not gonna cry over spilt milk. You know, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna compete no matter what. I mean, if if my finger's broken, I'm gonna wrestle the next day because that's just a, that's a way of life for us. You know, I mean, we didn't. If if I tore my rotator cuff or if I subplex my kneecap. Uh, I'm going to wrestle the next day. I'm going to try to wrestle, but I'm going to take a little time off if it's, if it's, if I need to, and I'll be. I guarantee you, I'll be back on the mat in a week. You know, and I think that's the mental attitude that that uh, the amateur people have, and I think that was one of the things that Jim uh, was was pressing on uh, when I met with him was stating that you know the, the amateur people are very durable, and that's what that's what they are we're looking for. So, what are your, what are your friends in the amateur world that have seen like the success of Kurt Angle and how much fun you're having, and just go, "This is something that I want to do." Oh yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I look back, and I mean, I I think some days I take this job for granted because, I mean, where else can I? I mean, this is the perfect job. I mean, so you know, it's just amazing to me how I can just spend time in the weight room, spend time uh, taking care of my body. Spend time in the ring, uh, throwing guys around, getting thrown around. Uh, it's the best job in the world. <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'm very uh, thank God every day, and I'm and I thank the WWF for for giving me this opportunity. You know, so I mean, it's I'm I'm enjoying myself.
Any specific names of that? people that you think would just okay. be awesome? Uh, I, I didn't understand you. What, repeat yourself, please. Oh, any specific names that you know that uh, you think would do really good? Oh, like any any of the other guys like at Minnesota or some college wrestlers that you've seen that you think might be suited for this? Um, right now, uh, as far as uh, I, I think that that Brandon Eggum, um, he wrestled 184 pounds for the University of Minnesota. Uh, I think he could do a very well jo good job. Um, I mean, there's there's a, there's a handful of guys in, in you know in the Division One ranks that that. Could could have this opportunity and just you know that top top my head right now. No, I mean in, as you look in the in the heavyweight class this year, very young guys and very very uh, small heavyweights, w w which was wrestling this year. I mean there was there was nobody out there that I mean the, the guy that won heavyweight was was 235 pounds, you know, mm -hmm. uh, versus you know you got uh, Stephen Neal or I myself or Kerry McCoy or you know, or, you know, the Tolly Thompsons, which were all, you know, 260, 70 pound guys. You know, so the heavyweight class this year was very small. Um, our, my, the guy that replaced me, uh, Garrett Lowney, which was a, a Greco Roman, uh, he placed third, uh, at the Olympic Games this year, um, is not a big guy. You know, he's 225 pounds, six feet, you know, one. You know, not, not very good, but, you know, I, I could see, you know, see a handful of guys, but uh, who's to say, you know, who's to say that I'm I, I'm going to be a good professional wrestler, you know? I'm trying my damnedest, but who's to say that I'm going to be, you know? So it, it's it's as, like it's hard to, it's hard to say. As an amateur wrestler, what are your thoughts of Kale Sanderson? Oh wow, um, I I got to spend a lot of time with Kale last summer and doing I did a, a, quite a few camps with Kale. Uh, Talk about a, a nice guy. Talk about a very talented kid. Um, humble too. Very humble. Very, yeah. very, very humble. Um, he was the nicest guy in the world. I, I, I couldn't uh, ask for anybody more to to carry a, a, you know all that weight on his shoulders. And he's he's going to do a wonderful job uh, by doing it. You know, winning his third NCAA uh, championship this year. Um, you know, just 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 a, just a great guy. Hopefully. I'm, I'm pulling for him again next year, you know, and uh, to be a four-time uh, NCAA champion and to go on and, and to uh, go on and, and surpass uh, Dan Gable, which which I hope that which I know that he could probably do. I got a question: How? I mean, you're someone who's been through the top ranks of amateur wrestling for a couple of years. How difficult is it? Because to me, it seems like. The idea that a guy could win 119 straight matches, it actually boggles my mind because, you know, everyone's got a bad day. What if you have, like, you know, a little bit of the flu and you face a tough guy? I mean, he's he hasn't lost in three years. I mean, as a it's, freshman, he didn't lose. It's, it's amazing. I mean, um, I went through college, and I um, my four, in four years of college, I lost, uh, you know, 14 times. You know, and, and, I wasn't, and I didn't even wrestle Division One for two years. You know, it was junior college. For this kid to go 119, 120, whatever it is, uh, unbeaten, it's, uh, I have a lot of respect for the guy. Um, me being an amateur wrestler, that's, that's amazing. Uh, I'm happy for the guy. Let's start taking phone calls. We'll start with Harant in California. You're first up with Brock Lesnar. Hey guys, how you doing? Really good. good. Hey. Uh, first couple, uh, comments for, uh, Brock. Uh, one aspect that seems to hold true about amateur wrestlers is uh, their dedication and their work ethic. And I think if you combine those two things that you have with that tremendous physique and all the wrestling talent and all the wrestling knowledge you have at Ohio Valley, I think it's going to be a matter of time before we see you as a player on TV. And I just wanted to let you know that even though we don't get to see you out here in California, you do have people that do appreciate what you are doing and just wanted to tell you well, to keep going, man. Hey, um, thank, thanks a lot. I mean, that's, that's good to hear. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, no problem. Second thing is actually for the show. Uh, you guys put the show on 10 hours a week, and honestly to me, it's the 10 hours most entertaining of wrestling that I get a week. Um, Thanks. I, I do listen to the law, and I like the law, but I think the show is just on a whole different level. And the knowledge really? you get. Really? I mean, I, I love doing the law myself. So. Yeah, I, 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 the law is such a fun show, and it's good to hear the Canadian aspect of it, too. But I, I just think uh, the show is just on a uh, different level. Um, oh, now, I have a question for you, Dave. Um, mm -hmm. I think you might have covered this a couple of weeks ago, 
but my computer crashed right about when you guys are covering it, so uh just wanted to go ahead and ask you this. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a segment on one of the Raws where uh, it was actually November of 97, and it was one of the first DX segments, and it was when Sean and Hunter were doing a rib with bananas. Now, at that time, my friend told me an odd story that I don't know if you want me to bring up, but basically, you don't have point, to bring them up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't have to bring them up. But that's probably the true story, the one you're thinking. Did it involve yeah. uh, Mr. Cornett? I, I have always heard that. Yes. Okay. That's it's it. not the one that involves Dave. Okay. No. 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 no, no not the one that involves Dave. That's a different Mr. story. In the picture, I was told, and I, I uh, just, want, I just want to clarify if that was true. Um, that's what I always heard. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um. Well, guys, I just wanted to tell you guys how basically felt about the show. And, Brock, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. And hopefully we'll hear from you guys again. Okay. All right, thanks, Chris. All right, we're going to run, we're going to go John in Florida. John, how you doing today? Hey, Dave, how you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good. <laughs> Listen, I got a question to ask you. Is anything going to happen at WrestleMania that's supposed to happen with the WCW guys and the WWF guys? Everything that's supposed to happen hopefully will happen. <laughs> as far as for the WCW guys, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I don't. I mean, I think that they should. Ha I think something should happen. Um, I think Wade Tell is full of shit. To be honest with you. <laughs> what's he saying? What do you say? He's, he's got oh, you should hear him. Booker T's going to be in Shane's corner. He's going to challenge The Rock. Maybe, maybe they'll do that. That wouldn't be the worst. You know, that's not the worst idea in the world. They they still got to make a lot of deals because right now, um, you know, everyone's. I mean, everyone's pretty much on hold. I mean, it's. If they can make the, it, it'd be a good part of the show. As far as, I mean, I have not heard of anything happening, but at the same time, I'm probably the person that they wouldn't tell that to first. <laughs> if you know what I mean? Yeah. Just until after the show. After the show, they'll tell me, but I don't think they'll tell me before. Is it if Linda wasn't going to be there in the wheelchair, I would think for sure that somebody would be in Shane's corner. But the fact that she's there, I don't know. It, it almost just tracks because I think the big pops Linda coming out, and and if there's too many things going on, it. But then again, it's Vince's match, so there are going to be too many things going on. Because there has to be. It's Vince, you know? Is this true about Vince. Sting? What about Sting? They're reporting that he don't want to work for Vince, so he's going to retire. I think that's a very good chance, yes. I mean, it's not, nothing's for sure. I mean, believe me, nothing's for sure. But I would not be surprised that that's not how that winds up. Um, <laughs> Sting's never really wanted to work there. He's, he's expressed that. He's got a great contract that he could sit out on. I mean, retire is a funny word because, you know, when the contract's up in ten months or a year, whenever Sting's contract's up, you know by then he may want to he may want to work there and they may want him a lot. You know you never know where the business is going to be in a year. There may be a spot for, you know, someone that they need in a hurry. I mean you just can't predict the future in wrestling. What are they? What are these guys going to do when the money runs out at the end of their contract? Uh, then I think that either they'll if, if they saved enough money they may retire or they'll go to work for Vince. They're not going to have much else. I don't need to work. That's no not more. it. What? Nash Nash said, I don't need to work. No, I got plenty. I got millions. He does have well, millions. Yeah, Nash. You know, Nash. Nash is too cool. You got to remember that. And Nash is never going to sell the fact that they don't want him. So if, they, if he thinks they don't want him, which seems to be the idea, uh, he's going to make it out like he doesn't want them. I mean, that's just the way he's going to do yeah. it. Yeah. And any and, truth to H H W F happening? H H W H. What's what, am I missing something? Hulk Hogan's Wrestling Federation with um. Yeah, I'm sure he's always <laughs> talking to people. Who who knows? The problem. You know, we talked about it all week. The problem's TV. I mean, there's there's enough talent out there to start a new company if you've got a great television time slot. But I thought Rupert those... Murdoch wanted Hulk Hogan. I, I, at times he did, but wrestling's got a people see wrestling on the downslide, and and the you know TV is not that you know these stations. Obviously, if, if Rupert Murdoch wanted wrestling that bad, um, Eric Bischoff would have a company on would would have a new company to be on Fox. Obviously, he doesn't want it that bad because that didn't that hasn't happened. What's the, the fact that Vince is Eric getting eleven o'clock time then? slot should tell you a lot. Yeah, that's the other thing. In fact, Vince is getting 11 on TNN, which is a weak station. That the best he's getting is 11 o'clock time slot. That tells you what the television. It's the, it's, it's Vince the of all people. Vince, yeah, the, the advertising on a station community he is, saved. Yeah, the, the advertising community is not hot on wrestling right now. It's just the reality of the situation. What's the chances of all the guys sitting out their contracts and Eric and Vince not wanting it and selling it back and Eric buying it? A zero percent. <sighs> Why? <laughs> that that Can't guy sitting. That? Vince is not selling this to anyone. Vince, Vince didn't buy his, away his competition to uh, give someone a, a, a key back into the door. You that's think not it was a good idea. he's not going to build it up and then sell it. Yeah. yeah. What's that's the not, odds? Why did he buy it? I don't understand why. 
to uh, keep to keep the competition away. As long as he's got all this, as long as he's got the rights to these guys, um, actually, you know, as long as you know, it it it, it keeps, you know basically keeps the competition away. That's that's the reason he's got it all. Plus, you know, hey, interpromotional done right, interpromotional should make money. All right, Dave, thanks. You're very welcome. Plus, he's got all those. He's, okay, he's also got all those hours that if they ever want to do something, whether it's the internet or for. Um, you know, for a, a 24-hour wrestling channel down the line, obviously it's not their plans right now. But there's all that tape someday could be worth a lot of money, maybe a lot more than ten million dollars or whatever it is that he paid for it. I, yeah. I do think, as a business deal, the amount he bought it for uh, is a steal, unless he just botches it up, which you know he may, but I don't think he will. I think anyway. ten million is great just for the library alone. Yeah, I, I, I know, I know. So and then and you know what. Whatever the name's worth, which isn't a whole lot right now, but but could be if you rebuild it. Anyway, let's go to Rick in Connecticut. Rick, what's going on? Hello. Hi. How you doing, guys? Hello. Hey. Um, about WCW, um, is there any chance of, of the deal falling through because of um, uh, antitrust issues or anything else? I don't think so. I, I mean, there, you know, I, until the final papers are signed, it's just like with a fusion deal. I guess there's a chance, but I think the chance is pretty darn slim. Because, in fact, I would say almost, I would really almost say there's no chance right now. I would say there's no chance because the bottom line is, is they've already folded the company, so and there's no other buyers, and there's no so, you know, I, I would say no. I'd say that there's there's almost no chance that it's going to fall through. As far as um, antitrust isn't, uh, aren't they technically not a monopoly because of all the independents and. Uh... You know, um, the that is a very interesting. That's a very interesting case there. Um, I would presume that somebody at some point will try to, you know, see if that's an antitrust thing. I, I could see that coming up. I, there are people who have talked to me about, you know, and I don't, I don't know enough about antitrust law, so I, I, I don't know if they are or they're not. But it is something that's come up, um, especially because they're going to have, uh, you know, what I would say would be exclusive arena rights to. Um, Every major arena. Uh, I mean, the TV is something. I mean, you can. They they won't have a monopoly on television unless nobody. I mean, they'll have it, but you know, I mean, it's not their fault. You can't blame them. There's other TV stations that just don't won't, won't carry wrestling. Um, I guess you know where that will come up is if someone tries to start something. If they do something illegal against them, they could be in trouble. Right, but I think that they're. Yeah, it's a stifle it. But uh, my feeling is, is they don't need to do that, and they won't do that, and. Uh, I don't think that they're, they're, you know, believe me, the people who run that company, you know, as far as like Linda McMahon, they are much too smart to fall into a trap where that's going to be their undoing, you know, so. I mean, it's not I, illegal to have a great product and good production and a TV deal. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure and the fact that nobody else, the fact the that nobody else The thing, that might be something there. Yeah, but I, you know, again, the, the, but that has But there are you know, other arenas. It's not like they have every single arena in the entire U.S. all uh, locked up. Yeah, but it, it's it's not like there's somebody out there who's trying to book all these arenas that's being told no because of WWF. So it's like yeah. right right now, right now, I, I mean, I don't know what anyone would have to complain about. Um, what what's your feeling as far as um, uh, just, just as far as how this is going to affect wrestling and, and WCW? I know that um, um, I feel kind of sad in this because uh, with WCW being uh not being on Turner anymore and not being on Monday Night. Kind of, kind of like the end of an era. How do you feel it's gonna? Um... It is. It, it's totally changed the business. I mean, I don't know how. I don't know, like uh, six months or eighteen months from now. I have no idea, really, what's going to happen. I don't think it's a good thing. I think that it's going to hurt wrestling in the long run. I think there may be one big pop coming up, then and afterwards it's going to be hurting unless somebody comes in because com hey, competition is what made this business, and 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 I hate to not see the competition. It, 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 it makes it it's harder for everyone. It's it's harder for the athletes. I mean, you know, if Brock turns into a total superstar, it'd be a lot better if there were two different companies for him to put his services, whether it's Brock or The Rock or or anyone in this industry. It's it's a lot better to have two companies, um, you know, that are competing with each other rather than one giant company. Competition makes uh, both individuals stronger, you know. So I mean, that's it's definitely, although. Um, I think Vince is going to do a very well, good job of uh, controlling both companies. <laughs> do you think? Yeah. Um, uh, no, go do, ahead. Do you think? I, I've heard talk that uh, you know Vince might fold it after two years or whatever. Do you think he's going to try to keep it around for? Uh, he's going to try to keep it around permanently. WCW as a different, as a separate company. I think inevitably, 
it's going to end up folded and merging into one. I just think that it's that's just the you know. But, but the, as far as the timetable, nobody knows because it's it, the market is going to determine that. It's when Vince will will close WCW when people stop going to WCW or stop watching it on TV or it costs too much to produce it as, as a separate thing. As long as he's making money with WCW, he won't fold it. So. The market yeah. is going to determine the time frame. It's not like Vince is going to go in and go, okay, this is 18 months, and then I move on to something else. It's like this business, you can't, you can't even book more than a month ahead, or you know, or you're going to be in trouble. So, you know, yeah, if 18 months down the road they're making a hundred thousand dollars profit a year, that thing's not going anywhere. Or, yeah, could, or, yeah, exactly. It's, it's, so the I'm just hoping gonna, maybe it'll be something like, uh, you know, the show becomes somewhat of a success. They move into a better time slot, and you know, it convinces some network that you know maybe we should. Maybe we should talk to Eric Bischoff. There's some guys out there. There's Kevin Nash and whoever else, you know. Maybe we can start something up. I mean, right now it's not going to happen, but I think that if things go really well, maybe there's a chance that it will happen. Um, yeah, but, yeah the best thing, if, if, if wrestling, if wrestling, you know, Brian's right. If, if wrestling gets on fire again because of this, uh, these, this, like Fox and all them, they will want a piece of the action at that point. Right now everyone's going like wrestling's on the downslide. Why get into something on the downslide? So it's again, the market's going to determine... Everything and then you know it's and also it's like one guy. I mean if you know it's like if Ted Turner was still in power at at, at uh, Time Warner, this still might not have happened. Or Jamie Kellner was in power, maybe they would have just said no, we can't do the WWF deal. We'll give it to Bischoff because we don't want to lose wrestling on these stations. It's like you just don't know who's going to be in what position and what. It's all you know. There's so many different factors. It's it's, it's hard to predict. Mm -hmm. Um and finally, as far as um um what do you know about um what what as far as us, Scott Steiner or Goldberg, as far as um, how badly or, or, or how not badly Vince wants those two, because it seems to me like uh, like you need those guys in WCW in order for it to be successful. And 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 as far as I mean, like the next WrestleMania, as far as I can see right now, like like a Goldberg and uh, and Steve Austin or even. Maybe even Scott Steiner in there would be a, uh, would be a, a really big draw if, if those guys can stay healthy. Done correctly. The, Done, the thing is, yeah. I think I think Vince's feeling is he doesn't need anyone. Um, I think, you know, I, I, I don't know. Vince, I mean, I know Vince, that Vince can make anybody into into a Scott Steiner or Goldberg. He can make his own person. Yeah. I think. that's my opinion. I mean, he doesn't need he doesn't need somebody's success already and then to build off of it. I think. Uh, I mean, good. Uh, to look at it, The Rock or, or Austin or all of his top talent, you know. I mean, he doesn't need somebody. And then, to, but I, you know, that's my opinion on it. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, you know, I, 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 yeah, he, he's not going to go with the feeling that he needs them. I don't know what, you know, again, they had a meeting. You know, they don't want trouble in their locker room. That's a real major point there. And, you know, there's different ways of looking at it. I mean, Steiner, was in, he was in a bad environment, but he also did a lot of things that, uh, you know they would never put up with, so so you know he's gonna have a, he's gonna have two strikes against him if they take him, and he's gonna have to behave, which he probably would because I think he knows what the game is. Goldberg, you know Goldberg, ah, he's got six million dollars on the table um, on his contract from WCW. Vince is not gonna pay him that money guaranteed, and and probably even even if, if you know unless he's the main event at WrestleMania for two straight years, he's gonna get that kind of money. So. You know, Bill Goldberg will probably be better off sitting out. If Vince wants him bad enough, you know, obviously he can make it worth his while, but that's up to Vince. It's, it's you know, every hey, everything's up to Vince. The ball is in his court on every decision. If he wants Steiner, he'll have Steiner. If he wants Goldberg, he'll have Goldberg. And if he doesn't want him, he, he ain't going to have him. So, you know, he's the only one who can answer that question for 100%. Uh, how about Ric Flair? I, th I think that they'll they'll do the right thing to keep Ric Flair. I think it's a good name to have. Um, certainly, if you, want to, if you have WCW... I think that you need to have Ric Flair at least for a, a transition period to get some of those fans like over. Um, I think Ric Flair is a very important name in the Carolinas, and and, and it is not even just that because they can draw in the Carolinas. They don't need Ric Flair, but I think that um, I think that they would want to do the right thing for Ric Flair. Yeah, um, and I, I expect Flair will wind up there. You know, it's not 100 percent either, but I I just expect that Ric Flair and Vince McMahon have always gotten along, so that's not really a problem. Do you think there's any possibility of like Ric Flair? Um feuding with The Rock at some point or something like that, or is that... I, I don't see it unless The Rock begs for it, in which case I think they would do it. You know, I mean, if, if Rock or Hunter 
want it just because it's like they're kind of like someone they grew up watching and just say, you know, I really want to work a match with him just because I, w I want to work a match with him. It'll happen. But I don't know that, you know, Rick's 52 years old, and I mean, as much as we all love Rick, you know, you can't take that away. I mean, that's just the reality. I mean, I watched him against Sting, and he's, he's not the Ric Flair that he once was. You, you can't be when you're 52, and after, all, you know, the thousands and thousands of matches that he's done. Okay, Anything I just have one last question. Uh, I, I read, I, is, is it true that uh, Scott Steiner is an All-American? Uh, Scott Steiner was, uh, I think he took fourth or sixth in the NCAA tournament in 86 and at 190 pounds. Um, he was, he, he was, uh, like, I think he had a record, you know. But, yeah, he was, uh, he was an All-American in his senior year at uh, University of Michigan. Rick, was, Rick Steiner was never an All-American, although he was a good heavyweight. Uh, um, my final question about my final. This is my final question about uh, Scott Rick Steiner or Lex Luger. Is there any chance? Uh, pretty darn slim in both cases. I would think uh, Rick Ste Lex Luger. I would think there's almost no chance. Oh, okay. Thanks. Uh, okay. Thanks a lot, Dave. All right. Oh, take care. Okay. Let's go to. Uh, is it uh, Bill in Brooklyn? Yeah. Um, hi, Mister. Um... I have a question, a couple of questions I'd like to ask you guys. Um, mm -hmm. The first question is for uh, Mr. Lester. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are you thinking of um, taking your uh, your talent to uh, UFC? No, 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 not even a, not even a thought in my mind uh, about <laughs> that. Not at all. <laughs> well, I, I, um, and uh, what about uh, the WWF? Are you planning on you know? That's, that's the plan. Uh, that, for sure. That I mean, is are you, are you, is that crossing your mind or anything like that? Uh, is that's, what crossing my mind? I mean, like, are you planning on like going to Vince or you know asking him to sign you on or whatever? No, he's already uh, signed to WWE. I've already signed. Oh, oh wait, well, I'm so sorry, guys. I mean, this is my yeah. first time calling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He signed. He's, he's got a developmental deal with, with WWF, and he's in Ohio Valley learning, lear, you know, training for the WWF right now. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. And um, um, this, the second question is uh, for you, Dave. Um, um, what, what's the deal here? What's the word on Bischoff? Well, is what what's his status now? What has he actually said? About hey, regarding regarding what he's very disappointed. I, I mean, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what is I mean, well, like, what is he doing now? Uh, you know, um, I Hanging don't out. really know. I mean, it's he's very disappointed because he didn't expect it to turn out like this. I will tell you that they had always figured that if if they didn't get WCW, they would start their own company. Mm. The idea that the TV networks would have no interest in wrestling was something that they didn't even realize until the last two weeks, and it hit them like a ton of bricks, and he's very disappointed. I mean, the losing of the WCW deal to Vince is not, it's like, like, like two percent of the disappointment. It's the, the inability to get television, um, at this time for anyone, which is the 98 percent. That's the real, that's the real big story. Vince buying the company is a big story, too, but the Turner Network's canceling wrestling is a much bigger story, right. and the fact that these other networks don't want wrestling, that's even bigger. Those, those are the real stories here. Well, uh, do you think Vince would, like, uh, hire Bischoff to uh, handle the uh, WCW? For, no, like, absolutely a... not. Absolutely no chance. <laughs> Okay, and um, like running from a management position or just like an on-screen character? Yeah, I mean, like there's an on, a chance on screen, on, yeah. on screen, on screen character. There's a, there's a chance. I wouldn't rule that one out. But as far as I, I wouldn't expect it. But as far as running from a management perspective, there is no chance. Okay, and uh, and uh, what about uh, Goldberg? You said something earlier there about Goldberg. I overheard. Um, is, uh, you know, I, I expect Goldberg to, you know, you know, no one knows because it's up to, you know, if Vince makes an offer and wants him, Vince can, Vince can get him. But I, my impression is, is that Goldberg, I think it's more likely Goldberg's going to be sitting out. I don't know if we'll, you know, what we'll see as far as Bill Goldberg and wrestling. I mean, it's going to be an amazing story of this guy who was this unbelievable, you know, phenomenon in 1998, and here it is 2001. I mean, like, ever since the end of 1998, his career has just gone, boy, that's a story, the career of Bill Goldberg and wrestling. Yeah, I mean, it's, an I, I, it's an amazing story. When he came through in '98, who would have ever thought that he would have never done anything after '98 in wrestling? That he would, you know, between the injuries and the bad booking, and then this buyout, it's like, it's like this career. That's people that, have to look at too. Is like a guy like Ric Flair. Ric Flair's been handled very, very badly at times, and he's done all right. But with Goldberg, he's a guy that 
if he's not handled perfectly, it's real bad news. So. All right, okay. So one last question, guys. Um, do you uh, think, like, somewhere down the road that um, Vince McMahon would give up the um, WCW for sale? He would let somebody else buy it? No. No, no. It, it's going to be with him, and then uh, when it's no longer profitable, it will cease to exist. It's, it's not like he's going to sell it off. No. Unless... I mean, you, you can never say never, but not at this time. Um, and what will he really sell anyway? He's not going to sell a profitable company. He's not going to sell the library back. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, when it when I, obviously when it gets better, you know, Fox or, you know, would would might want to you know purchase it from him, you know. Oh, but if it's, if it's profitable, why would he want to sell it? Well, you got a good point there. Um, I mean, it's either gonna it's he's either gonna fold it. He's either gonna fold it, or he's or or he's gonna keep it forever. I mean, and what's gonna end up happening is. is if it's not doing well, he's going to merge the good talent into the WWF. And that's the inevitability. That is what's going to happen, whether it's it may be five years from now and it may be nine months from now. It's all going to end up merging into one at some point. I mean, that's the WCW name will not be around forever. I, well, it won't be around. I, won't, I mean, it's not going to be around in four years or five years, I don't think, unless, you know, because you can't, you, can't, you can't keep the feud going forever. I mean, at some point, you know, the people are going to get tired of the feud. They're going to have to move on to something else. And at that point, uh, you know, he's going to have to just, you know, merge the companies. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. I love your show. This is from Dave Galvin. This is about something that we talked about. Because from what I've been researching in my coverage of the Microsoft trial, it is not illegal to have a monopoly if you happen to purchase your competition by being inventive or by being in the right place at the right time. Uh, what is illegal is if you were to use your monopoly to keep a monopoly or if you were to use it to gain a monopoly in another area, such as Microsoft telling computer manufacturers that they wanted that if they wanted Windows 95, they couldn't have Netscape Navigator on their machines. Microsoft was trying to push their own Internet Explorer. That's what got them in trouble. Um, I think that whatever it is, I think that the WF doesn't need to uh, be involved in any... Uh, the, but, but, but the nature of being in wrestling, and, and Vince McMahon grew up in the wrestling business, is to... Um, what's the word? To engage Grab your competition by the throat and squeeze. Stab him in the back and, and do everything to him. Now, but he is so much higher than all this competition that he really doesn't even need to worry about that. And that's why I don't see him getting into trouble because, you know, let's just say XPW gets, you know, I don't know, some television somewhere and wants to book things. You know, for Vince to like, you know, why even waste his time? I mean, he's got all this stuff that he's got to do, plus the XFL, if that thing keeps going. So... It's just one of those things where um, I I don't see them I don't see them falling in that trap, but uh, I don't know who knows. Anyway, let's get to as many phone calls as we can in our remaining minutes. Starting with Jay in New York. Jay, what's going on? Oh, uh, nothing much. Uh, my question is: Do you think that Eric Bischoff was actually capable of running the WCW? Um, in 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 what sense? Do I think he he was capable? He did a great job with it, and then he did a horrible job with it. So he's He's capable in both. He's been both capable and incapable. As far as for the future, I would have guessed that it would not succeed, ultimately. But you know, I wouldn't bet all, I wouldn't bet my uh, house on on it not succeeding. I know that they had a lot of. I know they had a lot of good ideas on the table, and they had a whole b bunch of new people they were going to bring in for different positions. And um, you know, it, 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 it would, they, we, we were going to have a fresh approach, and, and maybe it would have worked, and maybe it wouldn't. I, you know, you don't know for sure. You never got the chance to uh, to do the deal. Okay, my last question is, what do you think the odds of Goldberg versus Stone Cold Steve Austin are? Whatever Vince wants them to be. If Vince wants the match, it's going to happen. You know, it's funny, everyone keeps asking about that. If Vince wants it bad enough, he can make money with it, but he'll also upset the salary structure of his company, and it's his decision on whether he's going to do that. And uh, based on the information I've been told, and of course they could change their mind on a dime, it's not going to happen. But you know, again, it, it could, you know, they could change. As I said, they could change their mind tomorrow, and and it, will, and it will happen, and they'll just make Goldberg the right offer, and he'll come. And um, is what? How is Goldberg like getting the injuries? How bad are they? Are they? Well, he had a torn rotator or? cuff. He had a torn what rotator cuff. About? He punched through a window. Yeah, that was real bad. He he nearly lost his arm off of that one, and the torn rotator cuff. It's you know, it's an injury you get in sports. Yeah. So. Are they career threatening? Most of them, or will the, the, he? when he punched through the window, that was he could have lost his arm. If you lost your arm, it's career ending. The rotator cuff, you know, people, everyone—I don't say everyone in wrestling, but many, many people in wrestling have had the rotator cuff. 
they've had the surgery. They've come back pretty much the same. You know, Flair had it a couple of times. Billy Gunn had it. Uh, who else has had the torn <laughs> rotator? Well, Billy Gunn didn't come back as good, but what, <laughs> what can I say? Okay, thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Let's go to Heath in St. Louis. Heath, what's going on? Hey, Dave. i uh, got a couple of things for you. i got a couple of questions, actually. First of all, um, with the gimmick Battle Royal, um, oh with the new acquisition of WCW, what's the chances of us seeing the Red Rooster? It's up to them. I would say, I would say, if somebody gimmick? again, this is one of those things. If you were in that meeting, that that meet, you know, that that writers meeting, and you right. said, "Hey, let's bring in the Red Rooster," I'll bet you it would happen. But if you're not in that meeting and nobody thought of it, then it probably won't happen. But yeah, they could get him, and you know, Terry Taylor's in good enough shape. He'll. Yeah, he's going to be in better shape than some of those guys that are in there. That's for sure. <laughs> and, the uh, chic, my God. With, uh, with uh, along the same line with that uh, battle royal, with the gobbly gooker, obviously someone's going to be inside it, and yes. obviously you know something that's going to be you know where everybody's going to be like ah there you go. Wouldn't it be more or less like Pete Rose? I mean, everybody thinks that, right? And it may be, but, but that's maybe there, or maybe in the uh, hardcore match. I just think yeah. he's going to win that hardcore title. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, if you were writing, he would. <laughs> I, well, I don't know about that, but <laughs> with the... oh no, you would you would come up with the idea and go, hey, this was a really dumb idea. Let's not yes. do it now. And they're going to go. I no, have an idea. Let's not idea. use. <laughs> but and the final thing is with uh, WCW with the late. I mean, with the you know, like we basically said, you know, it's not a very good time to have it on there. And one of the best things I would have thought of that you could possibly do with something like that was with Paul E and take. I mean, basically, you have the ECW roster in our contract, and if not, it's not going to take much to get them on that contract. Why can you not basically put uh, the ECW talent with Paulie run it under WCW's name on something late night, see what it can do with that, and then bring in guys such as like Brock and, you know, whoever else from the, you know, OVW. Well, I mean, they'll, they'll bring... You mean they'll, have an ECW bring, show? Yeah, like with under the WCW logo, I mean, it's got name recognition, but now you're, I mean, everybody's saying, you know, they're getting, you know, they're seeing ECW... And then this also, you know, a good stepping stone. Okay, Maybe well, not here's, most the, here's, here's the thing. ECW was on TNN and it failed. Right. They're not gonna. They're, Vince is not gonna put something on that failed already, right. and it failed in a much better time slot than 11 p.m. on Saturday night. True. So, but Vince so, didn't have his finger on it. I mean, now. No, no, no. You're right. You're right. He did, you're right. He didn't. But the WCW name is still way more valuable than the ECW name. I mean, as far as like. I expect that there will be some ECW talent thrown in the, into that mix, mm -hmm. it, you know. And and um, as far as who runs it, if, if you know, it hasn't been decided. I'm of the impression that Heyman will not be heavily involved in that thing. But if they make the decision to make to make him, then he will. But mm -hmm. that's again, all this stuff is, is stuff that still needs to be worked out. I mean, I've been given impressions of things, but you know, this this can all change on a you know everything that I've been told, and I've been told a lot has can can all change. But what was what was the main objective of bringing Heyman in? I mean, I understand to take over. He's got a great booking mind. He really does. He's just, what's um, that? and he's got a great booking mind. Oh yes, he, and he he's does. Great creative mind, and that's so. That's the objective. And so, he, okay. hey, he needed a job. They weren't you know, even long before Lawler was gone too. Yeah. It wasn't like Lawler left on a Tuesday afternoon, and they went, you know, isn't there a guy no, named they, Paul Heyman that used to run a company that we might be able to get a hands on? They'd been talking to Heyman for months and months. The deal was was eighty percent done a long time ago. Uh, when they realized that Paul wasn't going to be able to make it, and Paul's decision was, you know, what, what Paul was doing, he was stalling and stalling out, going there, hoping that the miracle would happen, and the miracle didn't happen. And you know, I talked to him about, he 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 was the first one who told me, and you know, he didn't, and, and, his, and his timing wasn't quite right. Okay, he did expect the TBS. You know, one of the things because I was talking to him about is like, you know, okay, let's just. Why don't you just sit it out for six months, okay? And I, this is not like advice to him. We talked about everything that was going on in wrestling. But it was like, okay, what about the idea of sitting out for six months? If Bischoff, fe if, if, if Bischoff succeeds, you can always go to Vince. Um, or, or to Bischoff, because he's got a great creative mind, even though Bischoff and Paulie don't get along at all. Right. Or, or if Bischoff fails, you start something up and you go on those Turner stations. That's great time slots. I mean, with those time slots, you can maybe do something. And his thing was, is they're going to cancel. If Bischoff fails, okay, they're going to cancel that wrestling on that time slot. I won't have that opportunity. And he, you know, the way he saw the landscape, he played his cards where I got to go to Vince. I have no other alternative. And that's what he did. And he was, he was righter than he thought he was at the time. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Dave, and uh, I like your show. I mean, I love it. So, and Brock, keep up the good work, man. Hey, thanks. Okay, let's go to John, California. John, what's up, gentlemen? How you doing? Good. Doing good. Hey. Um, 
Dave, I'm heading up to WrestleMania this weekend, going to do the meet and greet, and I know how you've always said you don't call, let's say, um, Mitty and Dennis Knight because he's known as Tex and stuff like that. These are people I have my, I have admired all my life. Um, what are some do's and don'ts of a meet and greet without just, me falling you've admired over Midian my all your life? I'm sorry? <laughs> you've admired Mitty all your life? Oh, yeah. You know, no, oh, but you know what I mean. Okay. Um, yeah. No, just 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 be nice. Don't try to be. A, don't when you meet a wrestler. Don't try to be a smart ass and try to pretend that you, you know, hey, I'm smart. I know something because that's like turn off number one. Just be nice and just go. You know, how's your kids? Or I don't know. Just just be friendly. There, mo there's some guys in every profession who are dicks, but most people in wrestling, if you're nice to them, they'll be nice to you back. I've heard some meet and greets are really bad, like Crash Holly and Big Boss Man. You think that really they'll go all out on? I mean, one? I mean, um, I. I, it's, it may be the day or whatever, you know. There's, you know, some. I, I don't know. I mean, even I've the never, nicest guy has a bad day. So yeah, just I mean, say you hi. Never know. They may, yeah, they may have a problem with their girlfriend that day. I mean, there's weird things that you know. They're 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 all human beings, and um, I, I I don't know. I mean, I I, I don't know of um, you know. I, I couldn't tell you like who's you know everyone that I meet in wrestling. They're usually they're usually pretty nice. There's some that aren't. What can you say? All right, gentlemen, take care. Have a good weekend. Okay, let's go to is it uh, Chris in Virginia? Yes, it is. Yes, Chris, how are you? How fine, how are you? Um, my first question is to Brock, Mr. Lesnar. Yes. I was wondering, um, who would you like to work with in the WWF? Who would I like to work with? Yeah. Um, I would like to work with anybody that I get the opportunity to work with, but um, I think I'd like to work with Kurt Angle, uh, you know, and uh, uh, the, the mastermind uh, Steve Austin. Would be great, um, you know. Undertaker, anybody, you know. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't deny anybody. I would be more than happy to work with anybody, any of the any of the stars up there, you know. Uh, Did you get a yet. chance to meet Austin when he came to Louisville? Yeah, very nice, very nice guy. But I mean, you know, it wouldn't bother me. I would work with, I would work with whoever. China, I don't care. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, I don't know about that one. <laughs> I, I, I'm cringing when you brought that one up. <laughs> also, but, um, no, I, I have no problem working with anybody, you know. But I think the, the the person that I would really like to work with would be Kurt, probably, just because of his amateur background and and uh, me, you know, both of us being shooters and and uh, amateurs. I think it would be it'd be great to work with Kurt. Did you have you have you wrestled Sylvester Trakai since you've been there? Yes, yeah. Yes, was I that, have. Any it, um any thoughts as far as that went or? Um, per se, what are you trying to what do you? What are you uh, I I don't know. I'm mean, just both being NCAA champions. I mean, did you do a lot of amateur like in your match, or was it just? Or you uh, just try to both. When I first got down here, we we did a lot of amateur, but now I mean, uh, the WWF knows that. Uh, I, that I was uh, a good amateur wrestler, and I'm trying to become a professional wrestler, so I need to adapt to become a professional wrestler. You know, so um, we we don't we do uh, actually I've worked with Sylvester quite a bit, and it's the matches have become more professional. Mm -hmm. Professional the first, wrestling. The first time I saw you wrestle, it was probably your first television match. You did a suplex. I think it was a Jerome Crony, but I could be wrong. Of the guy, the smaller <laughs> guy. And he like he was like a double arm suplex, and he like rotated like in midair. It was like the most in amazing the thing. Yeah, now what was that your idea, or, his, or did he just come up with this idea? Because I was looking at this, going like, this is like I never seen anything like this before. <laughs> that was uh, Jim Cornette's idea to to really <laughs> come in and give him a, a, a double arm suplex, but I gave it with a little more authority than I should have. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you weren't used to throwing around guys that were that small, are you? No, I he. No, that that was uh, we. La I just saw Crony last night work, uh, you know, and uh, we laugh about it every time we see each other. <laughs> <laughs> so that so that spot wasn't planned, then it just it just happened. Yeah, it just happened that way. Oh, because I saw that and I'm going like, now that that was impressive. <laughs> <laughs> it just happened wow. that way. Al, are there any, are any calls on the line? No more calls. Okay, let's run to a couple of emails real quick. We got just a couple minutes left in the show. Uh, let's see. Explain to me this: If WCW is only offering thirty cents on the dollar, and guys like Nash and Goldberg are going to set out their contracts, why doesn't Time Warner up there offer to fifty cents on the dollar to save the money? Actually, that would cost them money. Oh no, it would save the money in the long run. Yeah, and then the wrestlers like Goldberg might be more inclined to go to the WWF. Um, they may. This is all stuff that needs to be worked out. I mean, again, 
nobody, like Nash and Goldberg, have not heard from Time Warner. I mean, the 30 cents on a dollar is stuff that has come out, and it, and it probably is true, but they have not actually made those offers to Goldberg or Nash, and Vince has not made any offers to I don't think any, any of the top to... names have been talked about yet as far as the buyout. No, 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 no none of them have. I, I mean, I, I can't say none because I don't know everyone, but none that I've talked to have. And none have gotten, you know, bona fide this, this kind of offer from Vince. And until those two things happen, they can't even make a decision. You know, it's like, uh, you know, guys that have talked today. I mean, it's like, you know, like, I mean, Nash has gone public because Nash has this idea of what's going to happen. Plus, he knows they don't want him. Um, you know, Goldberg and Sting, you know, have they, they have their own minds. But most of the guys like, uh, you know, whether DDP, Booker T, uh, Ric Flair, all of those guys, I mean, they got to hear from both sides and then figure out exactly what's in their best financial interest. And, and since they haven't heard from either side, you know, there's really, when you talk about a decision, I mean, they don't even have the facts to make the decision, let alone have made the decision. Yeah. Uh, let's see. This is... Da, 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 da. Uh... I mean, one of the things that I've learned in, in being so green in this business in seven months uh, is is never say never. Anything is possible in this business, and it just goes to prove That's that sure. you know in the past <laughs> two weeks now that um, man uh, anything can happen. What was yeah. the thoughts at camp um, when when the word kind of got out that uh, WWF was buying WCW? I mean, I know none of you guys are really affiliated with WCW at all. But, uh, I mean, did anyone talk about it, or was it just sort of like, well... You oh, know, yeah, I mean, well, um, there's been a lot of changes down here as well. I mean, we, we lost... Uh, there's been some developmental guys uh, that um, <clears throat> are, I think, down here that are going to be losing their contracts. Uh, and, but has uh, anyone done that yet, or is that just like kind of the rumors you've heard? Um, that's just that's just some of the rumors that, that I, I've heard, I think, uh, on the, the... I think Ross mentioned it in the report. The Ross... But, but that was report, before... That, that was before, the Ross um, report is going to state this week, I think, uh, who who is being released. Yeah, the, 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 the but those decisions were made before this buyout because they were going to cut. You know, they were thinking of cutting develop. You know, some of the developmental guys they didn't think were going to make it. Um, you know, that that just you know just that was decision was probably made about four weeks ago. I'm thinking. Uh huh. Okay. But I don't I don't think uh, that uh, the buyout uh, really helped them guys out any uh, either. So. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree because now they have such so many people under under contract and. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if it's um, good or bad for me, or, or you know, or the same as uh, the guys down here. I have no idea, you know. But uh, like I said, only thing that we can do down here is just keep doing our job and, and try to do it the best we can. <laughs> What's uh, you know, um, as far as uh, is there any reason why you know, like Shelton has like really, I mean, he's really caught on, and and, and you know, and his acrobatics are pretty spectacular. Was he was, like? Was he a guy when he was an amateur wrestler who uh, was was acrobatic? I guess he really don't do like flips or nothing in amateur wrestling. But you know, I mean, certainly like with the what's the word I'm looking for? The agility, dexterity. Yeah. Was that was he I, known for that in amateur? Oh, uh, he was known for his speed and agility. Yeah, but I think uh, what helps Sheldon out a lot is is uh, he's he's watched it since he was a young kid, and uh, and he pretty much uh, the guy can do anything. You know he. Uh, all he has to do is see somebody do it, or you know, or he, th he just sits at home and, and plays uh, uh, his video games, and he gets ideas off of his video games. You know, he, <laughs> he uh, a lot of a lot of watching the the sport of wrestling and, and uh, video games is really, uh, I think, what helped attributes uh, his his talent. Do they give you a lot of tapes to watch down there too? Yeah, we watch. We have uh, we have. Uh, tapes that we would have to watch, training tapes and and so on. And, and Cornette gives us a tape every couple of weeks to to watch of you know old old uh, old school wrestling and you know the the good the you know the the matches uh, that happened long long ago. <laughs> you know good good psychology matches. You know and uh, but where did yeah. you, where did you get the idea of doing the Shooting Star Press on that show? Um. You know, we were in practice one day, and uh, me and Shelton are very competitive, and, and uh, I, everything that Shelton does, uh, I tried to do, and, and pretty much I can do everything that he can do. And and uh, one day he was trying to do the Shooting Star press, and uh, he couldn't do it, and I got up there the next day, and I just did it. And uh, this was in practice, and everybody was like, and I was like, whoa, I can't believe I just did that, you know, and... and uh, <laughs> 
so I kept practicing and practicing it, and, and actually it was uh, it was Shelton's idea and then Danny Davis's idea of that we should uh, incorporate that into the match, and, and uh, so it was one of those things where like, yeah, I'll do it, you know, and I I, I did it uh, 300 times on the crash pad, and and, and then I had guys uh, uh, laying down for me, and and I hit it every time, so um, it was I felt safe doing it and, and my opponents feel safe taking it so I think it, it was Shelton's idea pretty much Brock we're totally out of time I want to thank you very much for doing the show and I want to wish you the best of luck in your training oh, and hopefully we'll we'll see you in the WWF before too long and uh, you'll have a really you'll have a successful career in pro as you did in amateur yeah thanks for having me on here you guys I greatly appreciate it okay you're very welcome and Brian right. thanks of course for for being here and Al uh, thanks again, and we will see everybody tomorrow at 5. We're going to have Daryl Peterson, who was also a heck of an amateur wrestler before he became a pro wrestler as Max Payne, and uh, we'll be taking your phone calls and emails on the news that everyone wants to talk about tomorrow as well. And, of course, don't forget Sunday right after Mania, and we'll see you tomorrow at 5.